the soft embalming of the still midnight, shudder with careful fingers and benign how gloom these dyes, embowered from the light, and shaded in forgetfulness divine. O oh, soothest sleep, if so it please thee, close the mist of this thine hymn, my willing eyes. Await the amen, as thy poppy throws around my bed its lulling cherries. Then save me, or the past day will shine upon my pillow, breeding many woes. Save me from curious conscience, that still lords its strength for darkness, wallowing like a mole. Turn the key deftly in the oiled wards, and seal the hushed casket of my soul. Hi, I'm John Glover. I will be reciting How to Be a Poet by Wendell Berry. One, make a place to sit down. Sit down, be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill. More of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience. Patience joins times in eternity. Any reader who likes your poems, doubt their judgment. Two, breathe with unconditional breath the unconditional air. Shun electric wire, communicate slowly. Live a free dimension life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that scares the places in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places in the sacred places. Three, accept what comes from silence. Make the best of it you can. Of little words that come out of the silence like prayers. Prayed back to the one who prays. Make a poem that does not disturb the silence from which it came. Song of the Open Road 4 by Walt Whitman. The earth expanding, right hand and left hand. The picture alive, every part in its best light. The music falling where it is wanted, stopping where it is not wanted. The cheerful voice of the public road, the gay, fresh sentiment of the road. O oh, highway I travel, do you say to me, do not leave me? Do you say, venture not, if you leave me, you are lost? Do you say, I am already prepared, well beaten and undenied, adhere to me? O oh, public road, I say back, I am not afraid to leave you. Yet I love you. You express me better than I can express myself. You shall be more to me than just my poem. I think all heroic deeds were conceived in the open air, and all three poems also. I think I could stop here myself and do miracles. I think whatever I shall meet on the road I shall like, and whoever beholds me shall like me. I think whoever I see must be happy. Are we ready to go on? Okay, all right. Uh, Anna? Uh, I'm Anna O'Donnell, and I'm going to be reciting Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea. And I, on the opposite shore, will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night and with muffled oar silently rowed to the Charleston shore just as the moon rose over the bay, where, swinging wide at her moorings, lay the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship, with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified 
by its own reflection in the time. Meanwhile, his friend, through alley and street, wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him, he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbed the tower of the old North Church by the wooden stairs with stealthy tread to the belfry chamber overhead and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade by the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall where he paused to listen and looked down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Then he, in the churchyard, lay the dead in their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear, like a sentinel's tread, the watchful night wind as it went creeping along from tent to tent and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell, the place, and the hour, and the secret dread of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent in a shadowy something far away where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride on the opposite short locked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now gazed at the landscape far and near. Then, impetuous, stamped the earth and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old North Church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light. He springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, that lingers and gazes, till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs in a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath, from the pebbles in passing, a spark struck out by the steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all. And yet, through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding that night. And the spark struck out by that steed in his flight kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic meeting the ocean tides. And under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford Town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gaze at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge in Concord Town. He heard the bleating of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest. In the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For, born on the night wind of the past, through all our history, to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. Oh, so 
have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not. Poor death, nor yet canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, but, but what thy picture be, much pleasure. Then from thee much more must flow, and soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and souls delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell. And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, and better than thy stroke. Why swellest thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternal, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. calculate who won and